go ahead and be seated. I'm so honored that you chose to be here. I'm guessing most of you knew that Vision Weekend was, was designed to speak to the heart of you know, what we're sensing God say to our church in this season. And so the fact that you chose to be here is a big deal for me. Um, it just means that, that you want to you wanna sense what God's saying, you want to sense what God's doing, and you also want to be have a sense of where maybe God is, is wanting us to go. And so that you gave your time to be here on a weekend like this where we're talking maybe about others and we're talking about um, maybe something that, though it can bless you, is not specific to you. Um, means a lot, speaks a lot to how uh, amazing each of you are and how amazing uh, this church is. And not because I'm here and not because I'm the pastor, just because of because it's just how it is. What's amazing about this church has always been uh, how you love people. And um, so it makes it really easy for me to uh, talk to you about some things to anticipate in 2017. I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 24. If you brought your Bibles, you can flip there with me. While you're turning there, I just want to reemphasize what Matt said, what we've said for several weeks. Vow, our couples conference, is right around the corner next weekend at all of our services, our Saturday night, our two Sunday mornings. Ed and Lisa Young will be here, uh, which is an incredible blessing for us as a church. They're going to be speaking, not just on relationships, but all of our young people, our singles, anybody that's here uh, will really benefit from being here uh, next weekend. But I want to talk to those who are kind of on the fence, maybe, concerning vow or maybe different reasons why. Uh, maybe you're not thinking about going. I would tell you right now, uh, one of the biggest reasons I know people really wrestle with the idea of coming to a conference like this is you're thinking, man, I work all week. I'm busy. I've got kids. I've got pressures. I've got responsibilities to give Friday night and then Saturday. And then you want me to come back to church and all that. That's just a big ask. And I'm aware of that. But I want to really encourage you to seek um, and just to listen to maybe what God would say to you concerning your marriage, where it's at. I'm not saying that you're in a bad place. You have to be in a bad place to want to be at something like this. But I just think it's important that you really take times like this, take advantage of these times and invest, if you are able to, to invest in your relationship. And if there is any barrier, I can help you remove personally. Uh, so if finances are, are an obstacle for you, if you just go back there, let Rachel know. I know that we'll find a way to, to make it possible for you to be there uh, do what you can, and we'll, we'll make up the rest somehow. If you're here and you would want to help uh, a young couple or a couple that's in a difficult place and you want to sponsor them, you can do that as well. But I want to just take it one step further. I want to ask you to maybe think about a couple that you know could benefit from being at the couple's conference. Maybe they're in church. Maybe they're not in church. Maybe it's a son or a daughter, mother, father, niece or nephew, uh, someone that you know a friend, a neighbor, they could really benefit. And I want to challenge you. Sarah and I are going to uh, do our best to invite people. We want to, we want to encourage you to maybe even go out there and consider helping those people that aren't even here uh, be able to come to the marriage conference in some way. And if you can't do that, but you know they would come, if you could invite them and it would be taken care of, if you'll let them know back there at the table, we'll do everything we can to make sure any couple that you know that you're connected to that needs to be here, we'll do what we can. We'll, we'll make whatever sacrifices we have to to make sure that as many marriages and families are touched and blessed we know that the devil is attacking families. We know that he hates marriage. And the Bible says why. It's because God wants there to be a godly seed in the earth. And the enemy always hits the family. And if you've been through a divorce or something like that, there's no shame. We all face things. It's hard. It's tough. That's why we're doing things like this, because it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to do it. And we, we need to stand with each other. And so uh, the enemy is after that godly seed, our children and the next generation. So vow, vow, vow. Next week at this time, you'll be glad that you made it a priority to be there. Is that cool? Good? All right, I'll be quick, I promise. You'll notice I didn't even bring notes. I didn't bring a pulpit. I didn't bring anything because I'm going to shoot all my bullets really, really fast. This is going to be an oozy sermon, an oozy, just if there is such a thing, I don't know. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to the village called Emmaus, 
which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. Just for the sake of time, let's drop down to uh, verse number 30. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. What I want you to notice is what began with a, what began, thanks Mark, what began with a, a road ended in a table or ended at a table. So if we were to consider maybe just a couple things about this, this idea, this thought, the imagery to me is very powerful. We know that these two men had just been in the city of Jerusalem during the Passover feast. This particular Passover feast, which we're guessing is why they traveled to Jerusalem, potentially from their home, Emmaus, the city of Emmaus, which is considered an obscure and a despised place, but they had traveled to the city of Jerusalem for Passover, for this Jewish festival or this Jewish feast. And they get there and it just happens to be at the moment that Jesus is also been arrested. He's been found innocent, but of course he was at the cry of the people. Because of the cry of the people, he ended up taking the place of Barabbas, a murderer, many people believe a serial killer. And Barabbas was let go, and Jesus is going to be left in his place to pay uh, the price for, for Barabbas. Ultimately, we know paying the price for all of our sin. Jesus is there. They would have been in Jerusalem when he carried the cross down the Via Della Rosa. They would have been there. Whether they were there close by or witnessed from afar off, they would have watched as Jesus bled and died on the cross. So when they came to Jerusalem... They had certain anticipations, they had certain hopes, they had certain dreams, they had a certain idea of, of what they hoped Jesus would be or who they hoped he would be. They actually said, if we would have read every scripture, and you can look through it and I encourage you to do it later, they, they, they actually said that we hope that this Jesus, who they knew as a prophet, they knew he was mighty through God in word and deed, but they hoped that he might also be the redeemer of Israel or they hoped that he would be the Messiah. Obviously, they get there for the Passover feast after watching Jesus bleed and die. Now it's the third day. Jesus is risen. They're unaware of it. They're on their way back from Jerusalem and all their hopes have been dashed. All their, all their dreams have been devastated and they're on this road, this seven-mile road back to Emmaus, this despised, obscure place that they came from. And everything that they hoped and believed that they would experience with with the Passover and specifically with, with potentially Jesus being the Messiah to them is, is, is dead. And so their hopes are, are, are not there. They've, they're disappointed. And the Bible actually says that they're walking down this road and it uses the word sad, that they're very sad. This road, this seven mile road that represents to me a road that all of us find ourselves on at some point, some road of disappointment, some, some road of discouragement, some road where you never thought you would end up walking down it. Many of you have walked down the road of divorce, others of you the road of betrayal, others of you the road of tragedy or incredible loss, others of you the road of addiction. All across this city, all across this region, people find themselves on unfortunate roads. And it's interesting to me that as they walk down this road, Jesus comes, and it's like he's attracted to them, and he begins to walk down this road with them. He begins to listen to their conversation. He begins to listen to them reason. He begins to converse with them. He even begins to go through the scriptures with them. The Bible says he begins with with the prophet, he begins with Moses and then all the prophets and walks through the prophecies of even the Psalms and he begins to go through the scripture with them. But notice, they did not recognize him. The Bible says their eyes were restrained from knowing who he was. 
So they did not recognize who Jesus was by his voice. They did not recognize who Jesus was by his presence. They did not recognize who Jesus was because of any of those. They recognized him when they sat down at the table and he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and then he gave it, gave it to them. And the Bible says their eyes were open and immediately they knew him. So what I want you to see is Jesus actually said it like this when he described what his house was like. He said it's like this massive dinner, this massive feast that's been prepared. A great price has been paid. And he prepares the feast. He sends out the invites. Many turn down the invite. They pray that they would be excused from the, the meal, from the table. And Jesus then grabs his servants and he tells them, hey, I want you to go out to the highways and the byways. I want you to go out and get the maimed and the, bl the, the blind and, and the lame. I want you to go out and get all those out there. I want you to go into the alleyways. I want you to go into dark places. I want you to find the misfits and the outcasts of society. I want you to go out into all these roadways, these roads of disappointment, these roads of discouragement, these roads where people are devastated, their hopes are dead, their lives are are, are full of, of nothing but this idea my life will always be obscure and despised. That's the life, that's the road that people find, find their life on. And so Jesus said, I want you to go out there and I want you to compel those people to come to the table that I prepared. And I want them to come to this table. Now notice he immediately follows it up by saying, so that my house might be full. In other words, God's plan is that the church is not looked at like it's a gathering of people who just show up and, and we, we all have our individual. No, no, God's plan is that the church always looks like a table. A table where no matter what road of life we found ourselves on or no matter what road of life people have found themselves on that they know that in the end even if they're they're in a place where they don't see God anywhere in their situation they, they, they God feels a million miles from their situation their their life looks like there's no way God could in any way be in my life when it looks like this but yet at the end of the day if they'll find someone that will just simply go out into those highways and byways go into those roads and say hey listen it doesn't have to stop on the road if you allow us to it can end at a table and even though you may not see God in your situation right now there's a way you can sit down at a table and what God will do is he'll do just like he did with those two men what he'll do is he'll take the bread he'll he'll bless the bread he'll break it and he'll give it to you and then all of a sudden all the things you've never understood you can understand you can see God in your situation you can see God in the devastation you can see God in your brokenness But God reveals himself to people at tables, at tables. Church is designed to be a table. No matter what life has looked like, you're always invited to God's table. You're always welcome at God's table. A lot of people tell you, oh, no, you can't come to the table because of this reason or that reason or this thing or that thing. But J Jesus made it really, really clear. Hey, I want you to go out and grab all the people that everyone else says wouldn't want to be at the table or are not. Well, I want you to go get them. And I want you to set them down at the table. I remember when I was 16 years old, I had no knowledge of God. I had no understanding of God. I, I was on a road that probably would have led to to obscurity at best, but probably, probably even worse. I probably would have been dead or a prison or something. And I found myself, of all places, in a lunchroom at my high school, and who would end up becoming my youth pastor, sat down at the same table I was at. He invited me to a church service just like this, a small little church. And I'll never forget him preaching about Jesus, preaching about him dying for our sins, preaching about, and I, I, I'd never heard it that way. And all of a sudden, in that moment, in that church service, at that table, my eyes were opened. And just like those two disciples on that road to Emmaus, 
Immediately, I knew him. Immediately, I knew that he had been with me every step of the way. Immediately, I knew he had been with me down every broken-hearted road that I had been down. He, he was with me. And it, in that moment, my eyes were opened. You see, I think about how God works in our lives. How just like at that table, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it. That's what he does with us. If we're really to be the church in 2017 we're supposed to be, then we'll find ourselves not just at the table, but we'll find ourselves being willing, willing to be taken, blessed, broken, and given so other people can see the, the realness of God, the, the realness of who he is and who he can be in our life. If we'll be willing, that's how God has always looked, worked throughout scripture. He took Moses out of the, is it where he started with the, these two guys. He took Moses out of the river Nile. Moses' name means to be drawn out. He takes him out of the river. He puts him in Pharaoh's palace. He receives this great education. He receives this position, this prominence, so he's blessed. He doesn't stay there, though. He ends up in the wilderness for 40 years where he's broken for 40 years. And ultimately, after being broken, he was given back to be the deliverer of Israel. He was taken. He was blessed. He was broken and he was given. David was taken out from being a shepherd on the backside of the desert. He was blessed by giving, God giving him the victory over Goliath, him receiving the king's daughter's hand in marriage. He's there sitting at the king's table, blessed with all kinds of opportunity, all kinds of influence, but then he ends up being broken as he's running from Saul who wants to assassinate him. And for 15 years of his life, he was running away from King Saul who tried to kill him before ultimately he was given back to lead Israel. God took him, God blessed him, God broke him, and then God gave him. The apostles, every single one of them, the story is the same, God took them out of their situation, out of the world that they were living in. He blessed them with power from on high, but they ultimately were persecuted, broken, and every single one of them except John became martyrs. They gave their life so that you and I could now have, we would be given the New Testament, every one of the epistles, the gospels, the word of God was given to us because he took them, he blessed them, he broke them, and out of that brokenness they were willing to be given so our eyes could be open to the wondrous things in God's word. And Jesus led the way with this example. He was taken, he was blessed with ministry and miracles and influence, but he was broken on a horrible cross where he bled and died for our sin so he could be given for the sins of the world. In 2017, my challenge to this church is to simply remember that there are people all over this city and they're on a road. They're on a road that our prayer is would lead to a table. A table where they would find people not blessed. They would, of course we wanna be blessed, but they would find their way to a group of people that are willing to be broken and willing to be given so that those who don't know who he is would experience him in the same way that we have. Think about it like this. That in 2017, we heard the story of Lydia with her girls in her small group. We heard the story of Matt and the awesome couples that were up here. We heard the story of, of the girl who found that place in, in God's house as she led us in worship. But in 2017, we, we have to be willing to say, God, would you be willing to give me? Would you be willing to give me? You have to be willing to say, God, give me. Our prayer in this church years ago went from, Lord, give us our city, to Lord, give us to our city. Not as a perfect church, not as a blessed church, but as a broken church to broken people. that They might see that, you know what, we might be broken, but we can heal together. We can grow together. We can, we can really overcome together. 
And what began on a road ended in a table. 